I'd like to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 15 this morning. Romans 15, verse 8, to be exact. If you didn't happen to bring a Bible with you this morning, there are Bibles in the pew racks in front of you or maybe beside you, and I believe you'll find Romans 15, 8 on page 949, or close by there in the pew Bibles. And as usual, the sermon text is printed uh, in the bulletin today. Just by way of reminder to those who were with us last week, or maybe especially for those of you who are visiting today, last Sunday we left off in Romans chapter 15, verse 7. And that verse says, Therefore welcome one another, as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So really that verse, Romans 15, 7, it serves almost like a summary of all that the Apostle Paul has been teaching us about genuine Christian love. In Romans 12 and 13, we were really challenged to love, to love fellow believers, to love our enemies, to love civil authorities, to love our neighbors, and to see that God's law, His written down word, His instructions and commands to us are really an expression of His love for us. And then in chapter 14 of Romans, and in the first six or seven verses of chapter 15, we were challenged to welcome one another. It's not different than loving. It's another way to express love, welcoming one another. Even when, and especially when, we disagree with one another on peripheral issues. That, again, is an expression of sincere Christian love. And as we said last week, as we think about how do you love in a way that is truly welcoming of one another... We need to look to an example, and Jesus is our ultimate example as we seek the edification, the building up of others for that ultimate end of glorifying God. So loving one another, building one another up, like Jesus has loved and built us up, is all for the glory of God. In other words, when we sacrificially love one another, we're imitating Jesus, and therefore, God is getting the glory. So with God's glory still in mind, with his weightiness, his fame, his majesty, his greatness in mind, Paul continues in verse 8 of Romans 15 to speak about how Christ's loving service, how his sacrificial love brings glory to God. So today's sermon passage is actually all about giving more glory to God. In verses 8 through 13, which we'll look at first, we'll see how Christ's service brings glory to God's character. And then in verses 14 to 21, we'll see how the Apostle Paul's mission is actually fueled by a desire for more of God's glory. Okay? So let's listen first to verses 8 through 13. This is God's word to us today. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. So as I said, these verses that I just read, verses 8 through 13, 
There we see how Christ's service, his loving sacrifice, brings glory to God the Father's character. And I want you to see that we specifically see God is a promise-keeping and merciful God. God's character, as we see in Christ, is promise-keeping and merciful. Look again at verse 8. Paul tells us that Christ, Jesus Christ, became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. So to say that God is truthful, as Paul just said, is to say that he keeps his promises. And we see God's promise-keeping character on full display in the service of Jesus to the Jews, to his fellow people, the Jewish people. Now I know, if you were listening, that the word Jew does not appear anywhere in the text that I just read. But it's implied in two words that are in the text. Those words are the circumcised and the patriarchs. Now if you remember, circumcision was the covenant sign given first to Abraham. It was a sign to say that Abraham and all his offspring were and are the chosen people of God. And so all males born into or adopted by Abraham's line were to be circumcised as a sign of their special relationship with Yahweh, Jehovah, the one true God. That's the circumcised. Furthermore, the patriarchs, that is the fathers of the Jewish people, like Abraham, then Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's 12 sons, and then Moses, David, and Solomon, the list could go on. Those patriarchs, they actually received explicit promises from God. God made promises to the patriarchs. Most notably, we could recall God's promise of blessing to Abraham that's recorded way back in Genesis 12, 2. That's where the Lord says, I will make you... Abraham, a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. That's an explicit promise to Abraham and his line. And we also recollect God's promise of a Christ, a, a Messiah, a chosen king that was given to King David as recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. The Lord said to Samuel, when your days are fulfilled, and when you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. It's a promise to David and David's line, the Jewish people. So Paul, writing thousands of years later after these promises, Paul is helping the Christians in Rome see that the life and the death and the resurrection and even the ascension of Jesus is the fulfillment of those promises made to Abraham and David. And many other promises we could look to as well. He's saying that the ministry of Jesus confirms that God is truthful. And that the God is trustworthy. The loving service of Jesus is evidence, rock-solid historical evidence of God's promise-keeping character. And when we think about God's promise-keeping character, we want to give glory to God because he keeps his promises. In the 1990s, some of you will remember a movement uh, among Christian men called Promise Keepers. Remember that? It was, it was this great endeavor calling men to keep their promises. To keep promises to their wives and their children and to keep their promises to God himself. Stadiums and arenas and conference centers 
all around the country were filled with, with zealous men of all ages encouraging one another to stay true to their word. It was really a noble endeavor, I think born out of a sincere desire to honor God and His word. But sadly, sooner or later, men will fail in keeping their promises. But it's in those moments where we fail to keep promises that we must remind ourselves that God is the true promise keeper. He is the promise keeper. He always keeps his promises. No matter how long we have to wait to see them fulfilled or confirmed, God will always keep his promises. God is a promise-keeping God. And for that, he's worthy of glory, fame, and majesty. Not only is God a promise-keeping God, Paul reminds us that God is a merciful God. Verse 9 reminds us that Christ's service was not only for the sake of the Jews, to whom those promises have been made, but also for the Gentiles. Specifically, if you look at verse 9, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So what is mercy? As I've probably said before, and I'll probably say again, mercy is not getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Mercy is God's compassion extended toward those who are actually deserving of punishment. That's mercy. Like we're actually all familiar with expressions of mercy on the human level. Mercy is giving your naughty child a second chance when he or she really deserves a spanking. Mercy is avoiding utter humiliation on the playing field or court by calling the game early when one team is already beating the other team back. That's mercy. Mercy is a police officer giving a warning when you really deserve a ticket. I would know nothing about such things. Now, strictly speaking, the Gentiles... That is, all the nations, all the peoples other than the Jews, the Gentiles had not received those special promises from God, like Abraham and his people. And as rebellious sinners, like the rest of mankind, they deserved nothing good from God because they had lived in utter disregard for God. And yet, God had determined to show mercy to the Gentiles, to show compassion to the nations, even though they didn't deserve it. In fact, Paul, here in Romans 15, he quotes from the Jewish scriptures four passages from what we would call the Old Testament. And these quotations prove God's intention to be merciful to the nations, to the Gentiles. David writes in what is Psalm 1849, they're quoted, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. The next quotation is Moses. Moses writes in Deuteronomy 32, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And then an anonymous psalmist writes in what is a quotation from Psalm 117, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. And let all the peoples extol him. And then the fourth quotation is the prophet Isaiah, who writes in Isaiah 11, The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. So all of these four quotations, each of these four quotations, envision Jews like David, Moses and Isaiah worshiping alongside Gentiles. As Gentiles come under the rule and reign of the root of Jesse. See that little phrase in the Isaiah quotation? The root of Jesse? Remember how, you remember Jesse, right? 
Not Uncle Jesse of Dukes of Hazard or Full House fame. No. Just making sure you're listening. No. Jesse. Who is Jesse? Jesse is the father of King David. King David, the one who had been promised a forever king, as we heard from 2 Samuel 7. So Jesus is the root of Jesse because he springs forth from Jesse's family tree. And all the Gentiles who come under the rule and reign of King Jesus, the root of Jesse, who come to repentance and faith under his rule and reign, they receive mercy instead of judgment. And so this causes us once again to glorify God because of his character. Sinners receive salvation instead of damnation. People deserving of punishment get mercy instead of judgment. And so Paul, in reflecting on God's promise-keeping character to the Jews and his merciful character to the Gentiles, it just causes Paul to break into prayer in verse 13. See this little prayer that wraps up this section of today's sermon text? This is his heartfelt request for the church at Rome living in the first century A.D., a church that was made up of both Jewish and Gentile Christians. He prays, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. So you hear that? Paul's deepest desire is that all Christians, regardless of their ethnic background, whether Jew or Gentile, would put their hope in God. We have to remember that biblical hope is not just wishful thinking. It's rock-solid confidence in a God who has a proven track record. In this case, specifically, a track record of promise-keeping and mercy. And hope in the God of hope brings joy and peace to those who are believers in that God of hope. So do you know that joy and peace today? Have you, as an individual, put your hope in God? Your rock-solid confidence in Him and His promise-keeping and merciful character? Because listen, those who hope in God, they can face tragic loss. They can face family strife. They can face political chaos. They can face unmet expectations and any number of disappointments with joy and peace. Not because any of those circumstances are joyful or peaceful, but because God has promised eternal joy and peace to his people. And most importantly, God has promised that sinners who hope in Jesus can bake on the joy and the peace of forgiveness and eternal life instead of the judgment that we deserve. So my prayer for us, like Paul's prayer for the Romans, is that we would hope in our promise-keeping and merciful God. And then that our hope in God would fuel our mission even as it fueled the mission of the Apostle Paul himself, a mission which he describes in verses 14 to 21. So let's continue. Verse 14. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given me by God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles 
in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Holy Spirit, sorry, the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. So these verses, they show us that Paul's mission, his ambition, is fueled by God's glory. Paul's mission is fueled by God's glory. Or perhaps more accurately, we could say that Paul's mission is fueled by a lack of God's glory among the nations, the Gentiles. In verse 14, Paul begins with a, a kind and courteous word to the church at home in the first century. He says he's satisfied. See that word? He's satisfied with their goodness, their knowledge, their ability to instruct one another. In other words, though he's never met them, remember Paul's not yet been to Rome, he's confident of their authentic faith in Jesus. Of course, they have room to grow in love and other Christian virtues, as we all do. He knows that they already have been reached with the gospel. They're already believers. So he's affirming them in their faith. But in contrast, if you were listening, Paul is well aware and burdened by the fact that countless Gentiles, Countless nations have yet to put their hope in God. Untold numbers of Gentiles have yet to experience the mercy of God. They're still dead in their trespasses and sins. They're still lost in their rebellion. They're still deserving of God's wrath. And so he's motivated to bring Christ to the Gentiles, to the nations. Or as he says in verse 18, look there with me, to bring the Gentiles to obedience. That phrase, bring the Gentiles to obedience, might sound familiar to those of you who have been here for the, the duration of the Romans series that we started last fall. Because I think it's actually shorthand for a phrase that acts as like the bookends of Paul's letter to the Romans. The full phrase is the obedience of faith. So Paul wants to bring the Gentiles to the obedience of faith. In Romans 1.5, one bookend of the book of Romans, we hear Paul describe his intentions with these words. We have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. And then at the end of his letter to the Romans, in chapter 16, verse 25, Paul concludes with these words, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed, and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all the nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. That's his goal. The obedience of faith is a way to describe the authentic Christian life. 
It's acknowledging that while we're not saved by works of the law, works of obedience, authentic faith will always and ultimately express itself in acts of obedience. As John Stott says, Christians obey not because obedience leads to salvation, but because salvation leads to obedience. Or as Martin Luther, the champion of justification by faith, famously said, we are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. You saying something to that effect earlier when you said that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Right? The obedience of faith is the goal of the Apostle Paul. And as a special apostle, a sent one, specially commissioned by Jesus to go to the Gentile nations, Paul's desire is to see God's glory spread where it's lacking. He wants to see Gentiles from all over the world come to saving and faith in Jesus, which will result in God-glorifying obedience. Now, if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, he'd already given his life to take the gospel of Jesus to the nations. He'd already been on three massive missionary trips from Jerusalem up to Asia Minor, that is modern-day Turkey, to Greece, and evidently he went all the way up to the region of Illyricum, which would be the modern-day countries of Albania, and Montenegro, and Bosnia, and Herzegovina. But he's discontent. You, you hear his discontentment? He's not content with these efforts. He knows there are still people who are unreached, and unengaged with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he states his bold ambition in verse 20. He says, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. And then he confidently supports his ambition, ambitious mission with a prophetic promise from Isaiah 52, verse 15. That's the final quote in verse 21. That promise from the prophet Isaiah says, those who have not been told will see, and those who have never heard will understand. So again, Paul's deepest desire, his greatest ambition is that all Gentiles, that is all nations, all people groups, all ethnicities will come to see and understand that their only hope is Jesus. Because when the nations put their hope in Jesus, God gets the glory, right? Last Friday, on my day off, I was cycling down Banker's Road on what was an especially glorious autumn day. And as I was cycling, I was passed by a Sherwin-Williams paint van. And I noticed on the van, the Sherwin-Williams logo. So in case you weren't aware, the Sherwin-Williams logo is a paint can pouring paint all over the globe. And under that globe, it reads, cover the earth. It's the motto. Sherwin William Payne, cover the earth. That could be the motto of the Apostle Paul. Cover the earth. Not with paint, of course, but cover the earth with the glory of God. And with that mission in mind, Paul was committed to prioritize reaching the unreached and engaging the unengaged. He was satisfied, as he said, with the relative maturity of the Christians in Rome, where the foundation of the gospel had already been laid, and Paul now desired to go to the people, 
to go to the nations where Christ had not yet been named. Like Lewis and Clark were pioneers of the American West, the Apostle Paul desired to be a pioneering, trailblazing missionary so the nations might hope in God and that God would receive all the glory. Now, Paul was not dismissing the necessity of ministering to those who were already reached with the gospel. After all, he's writing a letter to Christians at the church at Rome. We're studying that letter with all its great theological truths and practical applications. So he cares about the already Christian. But he is making a case for prioritizing his mission to the Gentiles, to the nations who had not yet come to put their hope in Jesus. And this morning, I'd like us to consider our own role in pioneering missions. I'd like us to consider our own opportunity to participate in bringing hope to the nations for the glory of God. And I want to motivate us by sharing some population figures and statistics. So get out your writing utensil. Okay. According to the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention, there are 12,243 people groups in the world. A people group, in case you're unfamiliar with that term, is an ethno-linguistic group with a common self-identity that's shared by its various members. So in biblical terms, a nation, the Gentile nations, are, are not political nations as we think of them today, but they're ethnic groups. So the total number of nations in the world today is approximately 12,243. Write that down. Now write down this number underneath it. 7,323. 7,323. That is the number of unreached people groups in the world. It's a subset of those 12,243. And an unreached people group, according to most missions agency, is a people group where there are fewer than 2% of evangelical Christians. And with less than 2% of evangelical Christians in a people group, there's no indigenous native community of believing Christians that are able to really engage, engage the rest of their people group with a church planting effort. They just don't have a critical mass. If you're doing the math there, that means that over half of the people groups in the world today are still unreached with the gospel of Jesus. There's a glimmer of hope in their people group, but with such a small percentage of Christians, they still need lots of outside help, i.e. missionaries, to make the church more vibrant and the church more self-sustaining. Now write down one more number underneath the 7,323. 3,222. 3,222. That's the number of unengaged unreached people groups. It's a subset of the 7,323 unreached people groups. And an unengaged unreached people group is a people group where there is no church planting strategy, no consistent evangelical witness, no evidence of any faith or practice in any way. In other words, the unengaged, unreached people group knows nothing about Jesus. There's no foundation in place, to use Paul's word. There aren't even blueprints. They're completely unengaged and completely unaware of Jesus, and therefore, they have no hope. 3,222 people groups. They're lost, and they're headed toward punishment in a place that the Bible and Jesus himself 
calls hell. So my question for us today is what will we do about this overwhelming state of hopelessness in our world? First of all, let me remind you that we're already doing something at College Baptist. I'd say this church has a Pauline heart for missions. Approximately 20% of our annual budget goes toward missions, both global and domestic. So if, or I'd say when you give to College Baptist, you're giving to missions. And this global missions mentality, it's actually baked into our church mission statement, which says that we live to the praise of the glory of God by declaring his glory to all neighbors and nations through active service and personal involvement in Jesus' great commission. That's why we do things like Operation Christmas Travel, right, Sue Reed? That's why we take short-term mission trips, right, Dr. Larry? Jared and Stephanie? I want you to know that global missions is baked into our identity, and for that, I'm grateful. Furthermore, I want you to know that our mission board has set some criteria for taking on new missionaries. And one of those criteria is that we would partner with missionaries who are committed to reaching the unreached or engaging the unengaged people groups of our world. So when our mission budget grows, because you're giving grows, or when our currently supported faithful missionaries retire or leave the field for some other reason, we have more opportunities, more financial opportunities to take on new missionaries. And so the mission board, when they meet quarterly, they give prayerful consideration to intentionally supporting missionaries who are taking the gospel to the least reached peoples of our world. So we're doing something. We're giving. We're intentional about those with whom we partner. We've already engaged in global missions here at College Baptist. But I'd like us as a whole, and each of us as individuals, to prayerfully consider how we might do more. Not as a guilt trip, but as an opportunity. That we might have a healthy ambition like the one exhibited by the Apostle Paul. It seems to me that College Baptist Church is strategically positioned to raise up the next generation of pioneer missionaries. Because Sunday by Sunday, there are upwards of 150 or 200 college students worshiping with us regularly. What if we began to prayerfully encourage and strategically equip these young men and women to take the gospel to the nations? What if we at least planted seeds with college students and youth, and yes, even children, not in a manipulative sort of way, but in a genuine sort of way, planted a seed of a bold ambition, like verse 20, to make it your ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest you build on someone else's foundation. What if we took that seriously? And as we consider the future use of the 412 Center, let us remember that equipping the saints for the work of ministry includes raising up the next generation of pastors and global gospel workers from our own congregation and from the college students in our midst. That's our God-given duty. That's our God-given delight. Because where will the next generation of pastors and missionaries come from if they don't come from churches like ours? This is God's strategy. The local church raising up the next generation of pioneering missionaries. So I'd just like us to prayerfully consider how we might be more strategic about this global gospel opportunity in the days, in the months, and the years ahead.
Brothers and sisters, the nations are hopeless and God's glory is diminished where Jesus is not worshipped. As John Piper puts it, missions exists because worship doesn't. So we, may we be a church that prays more fervently, gives more generously, sends more strategically, and goes more boldly as we seek to finish the task which Jesus has set before us. That great task, the great commission to make disciples of all nations. Let's pray. Lord God, the task is great and daunting, and yet we are empowered by your Spirit to carry out the task. And so we pray that you grant us faith and courage and boldness and confidence in your promise-keeping and merciful character that we might have the privilege to tell our neighbors and nations of the good news of Jesus, who forgives sinners and grants eternal life to all who believe in him. We pray in his powerful name. Amen.